play guitar in Dead Space chamber music and I'm one of the co-organisers of the Dark Alchemy event series here in Bristol. And I'm Ellen, I'm a singer in Dead Space chamber music and I'm also one of the co-curators of Dark Alchemy. Well, the, 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 the term Dark Alchemy was actually a kind of subheading of the first one. Uh, the first one didn't have a title, but the subheading was kind of a night of dark and potent alchemy or something like that. And the idea was it's just this kind of it's combining elements. So while there's definitely a, co a cohesive vision, uh, uh, we like the idea that the music itself can be surprising. And also the fact that it's kind of experimental as well, similar to that process, is that we're, we're trying, we're learning by doing, and we're trying different things, and it's expanding from that. We're trying to be as creative in the approach to the events as we are to our individual uh, musical input. So in our case, Des Bichet Music, you know, Tommy's case, Tommy Creep. I'm Tommy Creep. Um, I make a cult horror themed modular synth music um, and also help out in the organization of dark alchemy i actually yeah i don't know i can't even i can't really imagine our band without those spaces i can't imagine our band without the dark alchemy event series you know it's really interconnected for us it does maybe sound like a bit of a kind of grandiose slightly silly thing to say perhaps but I think I'd say yeah music has a fairly religious significance to well to me personally um, it kind of makes sense that then we're putting on events in in these sacred spaces I mean from a practical sense I think it kind of works in that like most of the music isn't really like kind of music that you're going to dance to and so if you've got rows of pews you know just seating there that yeah I'm supposed to sit here as opposed to like if you had more ambient music in like a normal gig venue and everyone's kind of stood there and their feet are hurting after a while and also like the performance space is always like kind of right there in the center as if you're kind of delivering a sermon um, and so like thematically I think it totally works. I think it really affects the audience's behaviour and it affects their listening. Um, yeah. Sometimes isn't it before we've even played a note like before the first person has started there's, there can, there's often a kind of hush like a certain kind of hush that you just, it just doesn't happen in a conventional mm. venue. The state of mind that you're in um, has as a performer, I guess. It's just um, completely different to, to a conventional venue. It can be a bit unsettling sometimes, um, just because it sounds so completely so completely different to any other circumstances when one will be playing the guitar. And these spaces are kind of designed for like, kind of choral kind of music. Um, and so I was thinking that kind of playing music with kind of big bassy kicks and like just a lot of kind of bassy drones was just kind of kind of get muddied and kind of disappear into mush but um but then as soon as the sound was set up in there you, as long as the, you've got the right kind of volume then it just works it just sounds incredible i mean it's like you kind of turn the reverb off on the synth because you don't need it and just enjoy the natural reverb. Preparing to sing and just feeling it from the feet up, you know, that you're sort of tickling the bones under the... because there's often bones under your feet, you know. And I think that's all... It, it's all evocative to and connects directly to what we're doing and what we're conjuring up. We try and, like, use less obvious spaces, um, even if it's not somewhere like a church or a crypt, um, like we did an event at the 20th Century Flick Cinema. Um, we did one 
upstairs at the Stag and Hounds, which gets used for gigs, but but using it for something a bit more atmospheric. Like hopefully we were able to kind of use the kind of the history of the building and the room and the, the kind of old wooden panelling and just kind of bring it into the event a bit more than just having a punk show up there. Another thing that gets said to us is, I've never been in here. You know, I never knew this was here. I mean, especially in the kind of spaces we use, like the crypt is literally semi underground. and You access it through a tiny wooden door that people walk past and they completely miss right in the middle of Bristol, surrounded by concrete, you know, car parks and stuff. Um, they're pretty much essentially disused churches that are just like managed by like an independent trust. There's no like, we're not like supporting any kind of religious ideology by um, using these spaces. All it's doing is kind of preserving a hot historic space. The CCT is the Church's Conservation Trust, which look after churches that are no longer used for active worship. So they're still they're still consecrated, but there's no congregation that uses them on, on a regular basis. Although they would still be used for uh, different services at different times of the year. They're these doorways, you know, and that makes it even more otherworldly a little bit, you know, is, is those particular spaces are particularly the kind of hidden in plain sight of everyday life. Yeah, I think, yeah, otherworldly is, is a good um, description because it's so completely different to, I mean, certainly in the centre of Bristol, it, it's like, it, it is, um, yeah, you're in, you're in a different different world obviously when we enter yeah. these spaces we're entering these sacred spaces that don't have a pa obviously so um we work with andrew bayliss who many people around bristol will know isn't he's absolutely brilliant sound person um and he's done the sound for the last few events and it's just incredible um because i mean if we just hired in a pa ourselves we'd probably end up with something kind of underpowered but um but he brings in like subs and everything and just like literally fills the space he listens to the musicians that we're going to have on in advance he thinks about what kind of you know we go to the spaces and we talk about the sound he's he's put on events in these places before so he knows the, yeah, the sound in these spaces. The space works, yeah. And really, like, I can't stress enough so much of the success of what we've been doing has, has been in relation to his, his yeah, expertise which, oh, around sound. So. Yeah, mm. certainly um, the power that he was mm. able to, yeah. uh, to produce <laughs> from... <laughs> <laughs> you know everything that he set up from from knowing like it's his it's his equipment mm. to hear the artists sort of get so excited by how their sound feels in the space and um and yeah especially that one it with the feedback was incredible that we got from the artists and you know these are people who you know, they're, they're playing on, like, really serious spills across Europe. We didn't want to put together a lineup of bands that are all playing exactly the same type of music. And so it's just this kind of synergy between the space and the music but without being as simple as just like playing old music, you know, it's definitely got elements of like something new within it. Yeah, that idea that alchemy is going to mix together all of these different elements and and come up with uh, like like a new a new substance, a new complete substance, basically. Um, kind of people that you come across locally that you think wow their music would totally work with what we want to do and also kind of artists that you come across in other situations 
Lake. Um, for Dark Alchemy 4, we had the Nent and Scray over from Berlin, and that came about because Ellen and Tom had met them at a gig in London. Um, and then for like, other artists, like the sky is thin as paper here, um, he uses this like computer software that he's coded himself that makes generative music, and then he uses uh, like a connect controller to like join the different bits like wirelessly like with his hands and then project what he's doing um and so already that's like totally cool um <laughs> and then but then when you hear it it's like this kind of ambient post rock kind of thing that just builds and builds we intend and hope that people don't do the thing where it's like, oh, I'll just come for this band or that band. Whereas we all, all, all the promotion is a very, th it's very through described and it's very much about the whole and the transformative thing that would happen to the people who are part of that, um, the audience, so, and the artists themselves. The way it accommodates a certain sense of um, ceremony or ritual you know, and, and all the kind of, I mean, we love merch and we love producing, you know, art, art, items of art, you know, to go with and to in, enhance that experience. So whether it's the zine that had contributors from, you know, local artists and creators here, um, whether it was our own elixir that we produced and brewed, you know, like um, everything to just add into that sense of, of passing through into another space and suspending uh, reality at the end of the night just hmm. I was like yeah this is exactly the kind of thing that I want to attend <laughs> you know weeks sometimes months of meticulous planning um, and then on the day there's this adrenaline and focus hmm. you know mm -hmm. and then there's a certain moment where it is almost tangible each time I sort of physically feel it. It's like, this is the point where you've got to let go now. All what we've put in till now, everything we've done till now, is now going to decide. <laughs> you know, it's become its, its own animal and it's in the room. And that's it. It's going to do its thing now. And the precision with which you've developed it, you know, cooked it up, um, it's going to show itself. So I think the future is kind of, more of this kind of documenting it and kind of creating new things, more kind of collaboration, trying to find new spaces and also helping to preserve those spaces by the donations that we're able to generate from the gigs. Bristol is has an incredible wealth of spaces and unusual places um, and places even yet to be discovered by us, you know. Yeah. Redcliffe Caves. Redcliffe Caves is on our list as a. I, I mean, with this is a wish list, you know. I mean, yeah. I think we're just going to keep digging into what we can find here in Bristol, in terms of spaces. We're just a set of three people, with some really good friends who are happy to help. So yeah, just watch this space, I suppose. But we're not going to stop anytime soon. So. <laughs>